everyone. We're live. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Top to Bottom. I'm your host, Keenan, and I'm with Beck. Beck, where are you right now? I am in the Lem Flats in Paris. Je suis à Paris. Paris. <laughs> Why are you there, funny. Beck? I went here. Why are you there? I'm moving here. I'm looking for an apartment. And a French social You're security. You're moving full time back? Full time? I, I'm probably going to move here till about September. Oh, that's wow. a long time. So How do we come this visit? Is your new setting? I'm a, from here on out? This is it. I'm officially French. <laughs> You're Parisian? I'm Parisian. That's what Don't Simon told them that. I know. Well, Simon said it first. He said, how was your first day as a Parisian? I was like, bon. <laughs> bon. That would be good, everybody. Bon. Well, All right. with that, we're going to the first segment of this podcast, which is Email Teardown. This is the segment where we tear down emails uh, that were sent over to Beck and Keenan. Now on to email number one. This one, uh, the subject is, take a look at this. It's about salesgrowth.com. Hello, first name in parentheses. Just kidding, Keenan. I don't want to take more time than I have to. I know you're probably very busy, so I'll cut straight to the chase. I work at Emojo, a full-service digital marketing agency, and we recently ran a batch SEO analysis on several businesses in your area, including yours. Based on the metrics that were reported back to us, there are several issues that you might want to address. The report is fairly long, so I prefer sending it as an attachment instead of typing it out in an email. If you're interested in finding out the most pressing issues regarding your website, reply to this email and I'll send it to you as soon as possible. P.S. The report is completely free and there's no additional catch to this. Looking forward to hear back from you, Ethan Noah from Emojo Digital Solutions. Keenan, what do you think about this email? Look, man, I sent this to you because I got torqued, okay? So the, there's a very micro issue here that... Some of you who aren't paying attention may miss, but if you pay, if you take what I share with you here and you turn this into a, a macro issue, you should avoid it at all costs. Okay, this person lost one thousand percent credibility when they said in the quote because I can't read here it was something like, "This report is really big, so I'd rather send it as an attachment as opposed to put it in an email." Mm -hmm. You're a liar. You're a liar. You're a liar in a minute, but because you could have just put it in the fucking email. Yeah. You could have put it in the email right away. You could have said, hey, here it is, attached. Take a look. Pay special attention to page 3, 9, and 12, or pay special attention to these three things. Mm -hmm. And if this is something that concerns you, if this is something that you'd like to learn more about, call me and I can walk you through it. But instead, you're pulling some manipulative bullshit about mm -hmm. how you can't attach it and that for me to reply to you, for you to send it to me, Fuck you. You're a liar. You're a liar and you manipulate it, but I will never do business. What's the name of this company? Uh, Emojo. I will never do business with Emojo because I question your integrity. And then what did he say? How did he end it again? Not, what was the PS oh, part? Yes, the report is completely free and there's no additional catch to this. Yes, there is an additional catch. The additional catch is you made me say yes to get it when you could have just said it to me. So there is a catch. So you're a liar, you're manipulative, and I don't trust a goddamn word you say. That's why I said, and that's what too many salespeople do. Beck, take it away. Yeah, well, I don't know what he would gain from you saying yes. Like what? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I would have understood if he was trying to manipulate you to get you on a call. But if you just said yes back, what would he gain from you sending that, that report? So you know, I, Is that a real question? Yeah. This is my I mean, two cents is there isn't a report. They don't want to do the work. I say yes, they go do the report. Mm -hmm. Because this is scalable. If you did a report on everybody, that's not scalable. So I think that is their way to make it scalable. We did a report. We think the shit in there. Say yes. Oh, okay, go do a report. Now send it to them. Yeah. The other thing that I don't understand, and it's slight, but he says, I ran a batch SEO analysis on several businesses in your area. So I don't get why Geo would have anything to do with SEO for a business like yours. Like 
maybe if you sold like cupcakes in person. <laughs> yep. yep. You're virtual. So it doesn't mean like several in your industry. So I think to your point, it, it just feels like a trap from front to end. And uh, this is the last thing I'll say. One of the biggest spam triggers is the subject line, this isn't spam. It's so, it it's correct. It's so heavily used as a trigger to get people to use it that it's now a trigger to send you to spam. Yep. And I feel like that from front to end with this email that I'm like, he's like, I'll just cut to the chase. It's free and there's no additional catch to this. And I'm like, if there's no additional catch, then just ship it over. A Amen. Praise be to God. <laughs> so we only have 30 seconds. Do we want to go into a second email? Beck, want, give, Beck, give wise sage advice on how people should do things like this. Why, why they shouldn't? No, why they should. Like, how they should. How they should do something like this. How they should. I think that you should research problems that he's running into that he doesn't know about. And you should just send those over in an email. Be honest about it. Be upfront. Don't be afraid to give away value. <laughs> a completely clean record in paris a completely clean record <laughs> one section in way to go back i'm like jean valjean i have a completely clean record in paris <laughs> well done by the way your, your your girl the other day did awesome Sarah. sarah she was great she was great. And no woman out there listening had better say that he called her a girl because I will lose my shit. Okay, everybody? <laughs> Fucking just, I don't want to hear it. Keep it to yourself. Keep it to yourself. Don't want to hear it. Uh, well, with that, we're on to the next segment of our podcast, which is Sales Mythology. This is the segment where Beck and Keenan demystify common myths in the sales industry. So the first myth of today is all buyer intent is created equally. Beck, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, so the types of buyer intent, the main types are going to be, they either requested a demo, and then you have a big group of everything else. They downloaded content, they attended a webinar, non hand raising marketing action, they were researching you on the web, they were researching reviews about a competitive platform, they did a free trial of freemium. And not only are they not created equally, the biggest mistake I see people making is they give them an MQL score based on like, you know, a demo request is worth more points than someone who downloaded content. And then they send them a generic email that has nothing to do with the last trigger action that they took. Right. So they send like a generic email and they're gating out people who have become physical hand raisers for sake of an MQL score. So I think that's the biggest myth behind it is not only are they not created equally, but you have like whatever action they took means they wanted whatever action they took. In some cases, if they wanted to talk to you about the product, so it means they self-educated and they're ready to evaluate. They, they have self-diagnosed a problem and they want to evaluate if they can solve it with you. But all other cases, there's a various, a very degree lower level of intent that they're ready to buy. So I think that enters the opportunity for the seller or the SDR to find a problem or an impact that they don't know about to widen the gap of the problem so that they're willing to, they weren't willing to take a meeting on the pre-existing problem, current state, but with an increased level of problem because of the additional impact, they're willing to talk that through. Keenan, what do you think? That was heavy. Like, it's heavy. Beck, it's I, I, I gotta work, I gotta work harder to say with you intellectually. Um, <sighs> def def define buyer intent. Yeah, well, it's defined as a number of different things, usually. Uh, for this question, have, define it. For this question, define it. That there is some type of action that's been taken by a prospective buyer that makes a company think that they want to buy more. Okay, and so what was the question then, Min? Um, all buyer intent is created equally. Like they downloaded content, like they attended an event, and then yeah, I'm going to say, I'm going to say yes and no, because this isn't a take it or leave it. So I'm going to say yes in some, in, from, I'm going to make two arguments quickly. I'm going to say, yes, all buyer intent is the same. And I'm going to make that argument on the concept that um, 
there are different types of learners. So I'm going to go deep here too. There are kinesthetic, they're oratory, and then they're experiential. So I think that some people, unbeknownst to themselves, will want more information based on their learning style. I can picture an inv- a, 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 I can picture an environment where somebody who wants a demo because they're an experiential learner and they'd rather see that than try to read about what your thing does. You see what I'm saying? Like that, that style of trying to understand doesn't work for them. So they could read reviews and they could read what you say you do, but until they actually fucking see it, they're an experiential learner. They're like, I guess you call it kinesthetic kinesthetic and and visual. Sorry. I'm visual Mm -hmm. and experiential the same. Jesus Christ. Kinesthetic and experiential the same. Sorry. I mixed them up. Kinesthetic, visual, and oratory. So a, a, a demo is going to be experiential or kinetic as well as visual. So that's going to work for them. Other people, or you could call it oriented. The point being is d- different learning styles could drive different reasons to learn by mm-hmm. how they want to do it. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to say, yes, they all are equal. On the other side, I would argue they're not equal because someone may simply just be really, really curious and in the early stages and just want to read something they downloaded to understand one small piece. And then it's curious. And curiosity does not require a 45 minute session for you to talk and get in my grill. So mm-hmm. I could make a case for either, depending on who the person is, where they are in their buying cycle and their learning style. So I don't know if that's a myth or not. I'm just saying, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> well, to your, I never thought about it like that. And to your point, sometimes they're, they're trying to educate themselves and all and all. <laughs> Truly, I did it. I did it. That's why I feel so good inside. Anytime I can think of something Beck didn't think of, I feel special for the day. Because I'm like, in all cases, they're trying to educate themselves on how to solve a problem. So <laughs> if I am, for instance, downloading, you know, a cold email best in practice guide from a sales engagement vendor, I'm trying to download information on how to better solve for, let's say, a business problem of I'm not hitting quota attainment for SQLs. Another way that I could educate myself on how to solve that is on the tech and how that solves my problem. You know, so I think, yeah, again, where people mess up is they think that someone trying to solve the problem through downloading content on email best in practice means that they want to buy. And that's why you'll see that like the last variable that they'll look at for sort of this report is demo requests because they know that that's going to enter the pressure of the seller. Yep. Yep. So what I like, oh, sorry. No, go. So, what, so I like what you said, and, and it never occurred to me till right now, and the way we do things here at ASG is um, is we don't look at it as buyer intent. We look at them as triggers to allow us to understand what's going on. So technically speaking, we don't have MQLs here. We don't say, oh, this one's worth these many, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say MQLs. We don't have points. This one's worth more, this one's worth less. All we shoot for is the ability to have a conversation to understand where they are. Like, so whether you downloaded a document, whether you called for a demo, whatever, we don't care what your entrance is and we don't rank one higher than the other. We simply ask, is this enough to get you on the phone? Because if from an ASG perspective or gap sign perspective, we get you on the phone and we get to uncover what your problem is, then game on. We don't care how they come in. Do you think that there's something to be said and is an open question, true question about some buyers are downloading content and they're self-selecting out of like all things being equal. If I had any money, then I would buy a sales engagement provider, but I don't have any money. So the best thing that I can do is download this guide. So do you think that there is some kind of portion of like qualifying themselves? Yes, hundred percent, hundred percent. And that's, and that's why we do what we do. Yeah. I literally posted, no, it's not exactly the same because they were looking to buy some for 25 K, but I yeah. posted something on LinkedIn yesterday. That's why ASG spends so much time trying to just have the conversation because remember, and this is a whole conversation for another day. We should put this in there. Budget versus affordability. When someone comes in and says, Oh, I don't have the money. They nine out of 10 times they have the money because it's multi-million dollar company. Okay. And we're not talking about, you know, something that costs you 50% of your revenue. They just don't believe the problem is big enough to spend the money. And so when we get them on the phone and start having a conversation, they're like, I don't have the money. I'm like, okay. But if I said this, to, I think at our last session, we weren't here. If you have a $500,000 problem and it's going to cost you a hundred thousand to fix, I simply say, could you help me understand if you do nothing, this is going to cost you a half million dollars over the next six months. 
Why, if you don't have 100,000 to solve the problem, then you don't ha- can't lose a half million. Mm-hmm. The minute you put it in that perspective, money is found. Hmm. Money is found. I have a question on this, but I know we're going to go on to the next map. <laughs> No, okay, keep going. We can do enough. We, we yeah. need backups. Do you think that there is something to, if I have like, let's say a hundred thousand dollar problem, you know, or let's go a little bit higher. Let's do more realistic, a $2 million problem. Mm-hmm. And then you're evaluating your service of like, okay, this service is only 200 K. So net, net, it makes, it, it, it makes sense, you know, to essentially make the purchase. Do you think there is something to be said to how much the buyer believes? I agree that it's a $2 million problem, but how much of it can you solve? 100%. And do they believe that you can solve? Go ahead. 100%. Are you setting me up on purpose or is this a real question? No, it's a real question. Okay. So this is why I get so passionate about gap selling. Beck, you and I have spent countless hours having over drinks and talking about gap selling and why I believe it is, why I get so passionate and why all those people who say they can do it really can't, okay? That's where the root causes come in. Mm-hmm. The better you are at diagnosing why that $2 million problem exists, mm-hmm. specifically in their current processes, in their current approaches, in the current tools or yeah. lack of tools or lack of processes, to the extent that you clearly, clearly highlight and pull out of them the actual root causes, and then you can show one-to-one how you address those root causes, their confidence level of you doing it goes up. But salespeople don't know how to do that. So therefore, they can't show why this is why you have a $2 million problem. And this is how we can fix it. I love that, that last piece that you're saying. It drives... It's a mechanism to drive the confidence up when you can diagnose (laughs) because that's what the buyer is all the time thinking about is do you have confidence? I know that I have a, I I may, I may not often know that I have a $2 million problem. I thought it was $1 million, but more often I don't believe that you can solve a portion of it because you haven't been able to explain any value on the, on the line so far. Do you know where there's a great place that exists, right? a great place that exists is with um, those um, meeting setter people. Uh, you mean uh, that they like set meetings for you? Yeah. Like those out- companies that, that basically outsource and they'll, and you, they'll make all the calls and they'll do everything and they'll send you the meetings. We can get four to six meetings a week, blah, 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 blah. blah right. The reason I don't respond to them because they always say, don't you want more meetings? Keenan? wouldn't you like more meetings? Yeah, but I don't want more meetings. I want to grow revenue. And mm-hmm. every single client I have worked with, not one of these meeting center companies have actually gotten more closes. Not one. They get more meetings. Sometimes they get more meetings, but nine out of 10 times, the meetings don't work. They were the wrong person. The person didn't understand why they were there. The whole system is fucked up. So I think to your point, Beck, they, they lead with, do you want more meetings, Canon? Do you want to grow revenue? Don't you want to do this? Don't you? Yeah, you got it. I would like to grow fast and I'm already growing, right? I mean, I'd grow a thousand percent if I could, but I don't trust you can do it. Totally. Totally. Right? So you nailed it back 100%. Totally. And then of course the emails they send only hot to me. I'm like, well, if this is what you're going to send to the people that you're trying to get to buy from me. Then you're already losing. Yeah. I've yeah. already seen something better than that. And usually yeah. what it does increase is the debates on what was qualified and was this a real meeting or not. And my experience too. <laughs> All right, well, it's time to move on to the next segment of this podcast, which is Take It or Leave It. This is the segment where Keenan and Beck, uh, where I introduce common sales tactics, and Keenan and Beck let us know whether they would take it or leave it. Okay, hold on. Before we do that, though, I can't believe neither one of us, Beck, asked Min about his new pet caterpillar. What? Pet caterpillar? What are you yeah. talking about? The one that's been sitting on his lip all <laughs> I'll take the pet caterpillar. Man. I will I will tell you this. I will tell you this oh, is that it was not a personal choice. Um it was a, a girlfriend choice. So I have no say. 
she clearly on. just watched she clearly just watched top gun 100 <laughs> percent you got a new pet caterpillar it's freaking awesome. also we have not introduced the new uh format i'm not sure if uh all the viewers can see but we have a brand new format around the border i uh, hope y'all enjoy um but what's this, the new uh, title of the podcast yes the new s- title of the podcast is sales top to bottom beck do you want to uh explain why we changed it to sales top to bottom I, I don't because I'm at risk. So I'll just say, just go, go ahead and Google search top to bottom as is, and you can self-educate on why we changed the sales top to bottom. <laughs> <laughs> because once you do Google top to bottom, I'm just going to say personally, I learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, we're going on to our first take. How do we reset it. the counter? Do we Can we reset the counter? Yeah, let me let me let me reset the counter. Hold up. I'm gonna put up the segment intro real quick. Take it or leave it. All right. So again, uh, this is the segment where I introduce common sales tactics, and Beck and Keenan let us know whether they would take it or leave it. The first one of today is asking, what keeps you up at night? Keenan, take it or leave it. Leave it, leave it, leave it, leave it, leave it fucking put in the goddamn garbage disposal. Like I, I asked this question on, not this question. I asked the question on LinkedIn. First off, I don't know if I asked the question poorly or I'm being validated that salespeople do not pay attention because 90% of the responses didn't understand the question. I digress. But what a lot of them put was they interpreted my question as what do you ask buyers? It's a great question to ask buyers in a sale. And far too many said, what keeps you up tonight? Or what is your greatest challenge? Do not do that. There's nothing that projects more your lack of understanding of their business um, on on uh, how they do things or, the, or any provides any value to them. A salesperson asks me this, I lose my shit and hang up on them. So I want you to imagine you're you sell HR software, or let's imagine you sell financial services, or let's imagine you sell sales software. Those three. You ask me that question: What keeps you up at night? And that big of a thing. We're here to talk about HR software, my HR problems. We're here to talk about my finance problems. We're here to talk about my solve problems. I'm not going to tell you what the fuck keeps me up. And I, that's such a broad question. I don't even know what to do with that. My kid's not coming home on time. That's what keeps me up at night. Just, you're an asshole if you ask that question. And you just, you just, and the fact that you double down on it and think it's a good question shows me that you're not actually even thinking. You're in robotic mode. Some dipshit in some fucking book from 1982 told you to ask it. And you keep asking and double down why it's a good fucking question. Wake the fuck up. It's 2023. I Beck, what about you? Take it or leave it. I'm a hard leave it too. I think to keep like to Keenan's point, it broadcasts that you know nothing and that you've done zero research on the buyer person. You should know what typically keeps them up at night. If I'm coming to a call, it's because I want you to help me understand what's not keeping me up at night, but should be keeping me up at night because there's a problem I didn't know about. So I'm like, that's the role of a seller. I've seen this also morph into and make its way onto several LinkedIn posts of like, what are your top priorities in Q2? It's like, you should know those top priorities and you should be prioritizing other things that I wasn't prioritizing or maybe wasn't prioritizing to the degree that I should have been because I didn't know something. So I think it it front to end broadcast from the get go that it's just going to be a complete waste of time. Best case scenario on that discovery call. All right. The next one for today is mixing and matching sales methodologies. Beck, take it or leave it. Uh, 99.9% of methodologies, take it, gap, leave it. (laughs) Why so? I think... Keenan, you don't want to go. <laughs> I, as a seller, uh, had to, out of force, take different parts of methodologies. Some pieces were good here. Some pieces were good here. But none of them gave me a full enough picture of what I should be doing in the room before GAP. So I would take some pain-based selling. Okay, I think I need to be challenging the person. Okay, I think I need to be after upfront contracts. Okay, I think I need to be after solution selling. Okay, I think I need to be after value-based selling. Then we got to customer-centric selling and nothing 
really stuck with me other than some small techniques and small pieces. And I feel like across the board, sellers are doing that not because they want to be obstinate or they want to like rebel against any kind of methodology. It's because they don't believe based on the training that this training is going to work more effectively than whatever they have done in the past. And so most methodologies out of force of habit, like I did slice up and I'm still not regretting doing that. Like I had to do that for my cold call infrastructures. I had to do that for cold emails. You know, if like, I'm going to take this piece and this piece and this piece. But once I read gap, that was the first methodology that I believe front to end had an objective to the call that wasn't just after the seller you know, selling more and manipulating people. But Gap was the first time that it entered a methodology for me that I believe was to the advantage of the buyer, to the benefit of the buyer, actually helped the buyer and gave me as like a seller, a front to end picture of what I need to be after in the room with diagnosing. What Beck said, what Beck said. <laughs> yeah, what Beck said. What Beck said. <laughs> now with that, I, I, I don't know if we'll be able to get this in, but Scott Cronin, he just said, I take part of Sandler and Gap. And then he said, and Refine Lab. I haven't even heard of Refine Lab. So here's my question, Scott, if you could put it in the comments. What is Gap selling missing as far as you're concerned that you need or felt that you needed to add Sandler, you had to get from Sandler to make Gap more complete? Um, I'm very, very, very curious to that. So. so the interesting thing is if you go and you Google search sales methodologies, you can kind of see an evolution of like how feature centric we were and product centric we were. And then we got to pain and then we got to value centric and then we got to customer centric and then we got to solution centric. And like we have this evolution, but the interesting thing is like the actual motion based ones, Sandler's actually not one of them meaning Sandler sales methodology is the sales world according to Sandler with the Sandler submarine and the Sandler funnel. Now what backed it up was pain, but it wasn't called pain-based selling. Like they're essentially, that wasn't the thesis of the selling methodology. So it is interesting that I feel like we've pivoted more like towards our buyer over the last hundred years, but it's so sad that it's taken that long. And I feel like there, even if I'm like, okay, I need to add value. I'm like, well, how and why am I adding value? And in what context? And how are we defining value? Yeah, what does value even mean? Like yes. what's value to the actual buyer? Yes. And like, oh, okay, I need to be um, I need to be like consulted like con consultative selling, you know, like, okay, I need to be viewing this person as a, a like that I'm the consultant. And I'm like, but how do consultants go about that? And like, let me fast track this for you. They find the gap. They find the root cause and they solve for the gap. That's what they do. That's what, like how it clicked for me is I'm like, as a consultant, that I always had to find the problem and I have to find the root cause. And then I have to find the impacts that they don't know about because that's how I add value as a consultant. But Sandler actually isn't known as, if you Google sales methodologies right now as like the top 10, it's actually not in the top 10, like listed as a, I think you have, oh, you have snap selling in there. You have spin selling in there. Challengers in there. Um, yeah, you have snap selling by uh, Jill Conrath. I love Jill. It's not a methodology, but I love you. Totally. And so, like, you look at those methodologies. Is Gap in there yet? Uh, it's not Not in the uh, – yeah, totally. So I, I'm looking at all these methodologies, and I'm like, but what is the method? Like, I get if you want to intertwine your name, whatever, that's great. But, like, what's the actual method? What are you after? If you're going to say that you're a value centric seller, then you need to give me a framework for what the value means. How do I add it to the buyer? How do I find it myself? And like, what's the goal of adding that value to make them buy? Spin selling does a good job with that. That's a legitimate methodology. It's, but well, to me, spin selling is just breaking down the types of questions that you need to be asking. Like to me, that's more of the execution framework. Okay, so it's like a rubric. Right. It's like a, almost like a questions methodology of like, these are the types of questions that you would ask, but Fair I'm like, enough. do what though? Yeah. Do what? What are you trying to do in the room? So I'm like looking at all these methodologies and I'm like, and this is zero disrespect. I have an immense respect 
for sales history and like where we've taken and the trajectory that we've gone and like we're all just building pieces. But if I'm a seller and I'm going to Google and I'm like, okay, what like what what am I supposed to be doing in the room? That has been a giant question mark for so long. And it's just kind of shocking to me that we haven't as a like influencer industry, as a community, answered that for people of like, oh, well, you should ask this kind of discovery question. It's like, but why? Why am I asking that kind of question so that I can get the buyer to think in a certain way or I can manipulate them? Like, what is the thesis of what I need to be doing and accomplishing within discovery? And a litmus test of this is I see people say like, oh, discovery and demo can be done in the same call. And I'm like, but your discovery, I don't, I, I don't know what's in there, but it must be relatively short. And like, I had to learn a lot of technique-based questioning strategies for each one of these methodologies because the goal was never clean, like diagnosis. To me, it takes off a lift of like, what types of question technique wise am I doing if I'm after just diagnosing in the room and figuring out what that gap is and potentially adding to it by finding things that they don't know? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Like, so you don't need in your head, you don't need techniques if you're gap selling. No, not at all. And I'm like, it's kind of like saying that you need a doctor needs a technique to be able to diagnose. And it's like, not really. I mean, if you have a time based situation where you have to like within two minutes, otherwise this person's going to die. It's not a technique. It's just a smarter it's way. A hierarchy. To- it's a hierarchy. Check oh, this first, this first, this first. Go, 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 go. Yes, Rachel, but it's like, not, it's not technique. Not the most wrong answers. Yeah. But the leave behind for doctors is never, I want to make this person feel in a certain way. I guess net, net, you want to make them feel better. But mm-hmm. like, you know, to me, like a, a, a problem is going to be a combined pain. Like pain is bereft of impact. So yeah. like my dad was asking us the other day and then I promise we can move on. <laughs> but he, was, he was talking about, um, he had come uh, to my place in SF and uh, he was like, uh, oh, you have one knob missing from my my dresser Mm. so he's like we need to fix this and he's like why haven't you fixed this over the last couple months i'm like dad come on like look at look at me what do i look like tim the tool man taylor like i'm not gonna (laughs) fix this knob he goes okay so go with me on this mrs sales pain versus problem you haven't solved it yet he said so so you say that the only way someone's going to solve it is if a pain in the present is egregious enough or there's an impact that's big enough if you don't. And so he said, can you walk me through both of those? And so I'm like, well, the pain in the present right now isn't big enough because I can just use the other knob. Now if that other knob fell off, then I could probably just hit, hinge it from the bottom. If the clothes were so full that it took me five minutes to get that drawer open, okay, fine. I probably, you know, the pain's egregious enough in the present. He's like, okay, but what about the impact? I'm like, let's imagine that I foresaw with some kind of knob that like there was going to be a psycho murder killer likely coming after me. And the impact of me not being able to twist that knob fast enough was the killer was going to get me and I was going to die. There's an impact that would be big enough for me to say like, okay, I'm going to solve for this knob. So essentially it is extended pain. That's what impact is. But if you miss that piece, then all you're going after is current pain in the present, which I see is the massive instruction instruction find the pain in the present and i'm like but then you're missing a huge b-hag of pain that will happen to them if they don't solve for it and that's what accumulates to the majority so what so here, here's the piece so because i looked at scott's answer and i went so i missed it what did you say the the perceived impact if you thought ahead what did you say it was oh if like if i knew that there was going to be a psycho murder killer on the loose and that if i didn't get that non fix fast enough that potentially like i couldn't open a door handle for instance yeah, all right, but let's stay on the addressing one real quick, right? Let's stay on the addressing one. And because because what? I can help you with this because the size of the gap, it's all relative. So if if you knew that this would do it, you went to pull it once from the bottom and almost broke your nail off. Yeah. You're well, going to go get the knobs because you don't want to break the nail because one, it might break in an opportune time. Two, for you personally, because I've seen your nails are very important to you. And three, you don't want to spend $100 or $80. You may not be able to get into your. I keep going. I've got a good one that can tack into it. So let's say that like, okay, I know that there's a potential that I'm going to break a nail. But let's say that I have a very important like film event. Yeah. 
today. Yeah. You know? Like if I break this nail, I'll give you a great example. When we were on tour, uh, we were on tour. I got my nails done right before we, you know. I know, we, you're all excited. And then one, one, one nail, I was, you're supposed to basically push a button to open one of those doors, if you'll remember on the bus. But instead, I was trying to like man claw it open and I broke a nail. So the impact to me in that moment was not that, okay, it looks bad, was it was going to look bad Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday on tour. So four different sessions in front of live audiences with film and all the filming of, that we were going to do in between. So I'm like, this means that there's going to be 50 videos with me with this broken nail. So the minute that we landed there in Chicago, the bus driver was like, hey, there's like this nail shop around and I sprinted off the bus, yep. high fived him, and went and got my nails done because the impact, yep. essentially, it's more extended pain. So if yep. you're asking me, what's the pain in the present? It's just that my nail doesn't look good right now. And you're missing that huge BHAG of all of the. Yeah, but I, as I've said a million times, right? The, the, the problem is what you're dealing with. The impact is the motivation to buy. Totally. I've said that all the time. Root cause creates the problem. The business problem is what you got to fix, but it's the impact that creates the, 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 I just said it creates the, the trigger. Uh, yeah. The motivation to buy. The motivation to buy yeah. Right. So you nailed it. So look, we, we should probably do a show on this in its entirety because people just don't get it. But we, for poor man, he's, he's really let us go on and on, but I'm going to say this again, Scott, I see both of your answers here and they're good, but you have not answered my question. Scott Cronin, my question is, what is gap selling missing that you feel you need to fill with Sandler? Or if you're more of a Sandler guy, what is Sandler missing you feel you need to fill with gap? But I prefer the first one. What is it about gap that makes you feel you need to add Sandler to it? That's what I want to know the question. Put that in there. And if anybody else mixes them up, then I uh, said, give him a call. No, I'll call you, but I want you to tell me in here um, so people can see. Also, what piece of Sandler are you adding to it? Yes, what yes. Of Sandler? Yes, yeah, you know. great point. So what's missing? I guess I thought I could put one and one together with that. But yes, let's do this, Cronin. Okay, so Min, it's back to you. This is a good conversation. Thank you. Let's go. Of course, it's time to move on to the next segment of this podcast, my personal favorite, which is The Inbox. This is the segment where Keenan and Beck answer questions from our audience. And to help us with that is our trusty mailbox. Where's the... Man's uh, probably so pissed. The mailbox is open now. Let's see who decided to, to send us messages in. This one is a very long one, so stay with me for a little bit. Okay. <laughs> this one... Yeah, this one's from Benjamin Davies from LinkedIn. So, uh, well, meaning he works at LinkedIn. Oh, shit. This is going to be good. Yeah. Hey, Keenan and Beck. Thanks for this podcast and hope you guys never stop. I'm an AE at LinkedIn uh, selling recruitment solutions to recruitment uh, to recruiting agencies, basically helping them source talent for their clients. I feel finding problems and root causes is rather doable, but how do you get better at finding impact? <laughs> Oftentimes, asking impact questions, especially getting the client to quantify negative impact, can come across as interrogative. Also, by the way, I sell to MDs of search firms, and they are also salespeople, so they could smell from a mile away that I'm trying to get pointers to ultimately sell something. Help me out here. Thanks, Benjamin. Beck, what do you have to say about this? I get one pass per show, so I'm starting with Keenan. I Keenan, you got pass two. What do you think about this? So, the question I, he said is, I have a hard time getting to impact. He sells recruiting services. Yes, and he says specifically for quantifying negative impact, those questions can come across as interrogative. Well, okay, so I already know he's he's not doing a good job of diagnosing. I already know it. I already know it because. If you're in the field and, you, and you're selling recruiting services and somebody is having a difficult time, uh, I'm not exactly sure where he's selling. It's just kind of hard without a few more questions, but I'll assume he helps. He sells a LinkedIn service or something that gives people more access to more candidates that they can then turn around and, and, and what's the word, deliver or, or 
whatever the word is, submit, yeah. submit. Right? They, so he helped. Basically, I'm assuming his job is to help people submit or find more candidates to submit. Right. So he is a he is in this space should already know that if my candidate pool is small, then the chances of I me winning that deal is lower. So it's, he has to understand, am I talking to a contingency recruiter or am I talking to a, when they pay money? I forget what they're called, right? Mm-hmm. Or, or or what is it called? Contingency and, and they add as a word they use. They pay you up front, half of it, and you and you find someone and they pay the second half, right? Anyways, um, should, you should know the impacts. So you should know that if it's contingency, that you're competing with all of these other people. So if you're saying I have a hard time, root cause, finding enough candidates, and so then the impact would be if I don't find enough candidates, what percentage of the time do you lose to the competition and not fill a um, fill a, a rec, right? So if you have 100 recs, what's your rec filling rate, right? Mm-hmm. So you have a 3% fill rate, a 10% fill rate, a 15% fill rate, and a contingency-based environment against all these other assets. Hey, fucking LinkedIn guy, now I'm pissed off. Because this is the problem with salespeople. Here I go. The more I think about it, the more pissed off I get. I love that you asked the letter. I love that you want to get better. But it's fucking staring you in the goddamn eye. You don't understand what the fuck you're selling. And you don't understand the people you're selling to. Because if you did, you would know the impact of not having enough candidates to submit. You would know the impact if they don't win the deals. You would know the impact if they submit 20, 30 people and none of them get hired. You would know the impact. So you wouldn't have to ask them what the impact you would, you would literally be able to say because you don't have enough candidates, do you find that you're losing too many of your contingency deals? Oh my God, what percentage is that? What is your average rate? So when you lose, is you're leaving 500,000 million, whatever dollars on the table? Oh, that's a good fucking point. Come on, man. Come on, everybody. Sorry, Becky, let me go first. No. I took all the time. No, no, no. There's, there's a couple that I'd add in there. One that I would add is I would want to know, like, I'm assuming one of the business problems is you're not able to uh, fill enough roles. And I would like an example of a question you could ask is what types of roles are they trying to fill? So let's say that it's salespeople. And another question I could ask is like, okay, how many open AE roles do you have? And let's say like, I'm not going to be able to button this up in the next 10 seconds, by the way. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> no worries. That's my fault. Sorry. Becky. I don't want to get a horn. I don't want to get a horn to bear. I'll be very nice to you today. I'm a record parfait. <laughs> I can't do it. But point being, I would want to know the impact of not placing the specific role. So let's say that it's, I don't know, like like technical product people, and maybe they can't get products out fast enough. So then they're going to get eaten up by the competition. So all of a sudden, the CTO is going to be extremely pissed at HR because essentially they're losing market share because they're not able to produce products fast enough. Let's say that it's IT people and they're like getting hacked into from a cybersecurity perspective because they don't have enough people on staff. So like I would go more, what is the impact? That's corporate recruiting. That's corporate recruiting. Yeah. So yes, exactly. And so like, I would think more of the impact of what is like, I would want to know the specific roles that they're trying to hire for the other, uh, like the specific roles that they're trying to hire for. And what's the impact to that department and to that company specifically if it's SMB like they're do or die during the recession in terms of capital and 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 turnaround. What's the what's the um, the impact of not asking questions so that you can calculate the impact for the HR person of what happens if they don't get enough people enrolled? The other thing I would think about is it the right type of person in the role. So like I'll give you an example. LinkedIn is a very tech centric community. So let's say that you're getting a whole bunch of applicants for a technical role. You know for a very like you know, hyper growth, Forbes, unicorn company. That's like, you know, you, you get what I'm saying. And they can't find candidates who really understand the tech community. I would think LinkedIn would solve for that because by definition, they have to be on LinkedIn to be finding those, those goals. So one of the impacts of that could be like slow ramp, for instance, they don't understand the products. They don't understand the community or what about a, a partnerships roles that they're trying to fill. They don't have all the partnership recommendation. And the reason is because they vetted this on like a website as opposed to LinkedIn, which is where the first place that I would think as someone who's in tech. So I would go after, to answer your question, I'm trying to find the impacts that the HR manager doesn't know about. So some examples of the questions I could ask is what types of roles are you hiring? And like to date, is there like how many are open? What are the goals that they're trying to achieve through that? 
And if they know those, then you can calculate the impact of what happens if you don't get those people, the amount or the right kind of people in a role for them. All right. And with that, how can we make, how can we make, how can we make this a question for a future, uh, a future topic? Because this, this drives me crazy. Like, and I love the fact that this dude, what's his name? Uh, Benjamin Davies. Benjamin. So Benjamin Davies, if you're listening, you re- DM me directly and I'll spend 10 or 15 minutes with you to help you understand why you're not getting this right. I already know. And I, that's why I want to help because you want to get selling and you're trying, but I already know you're not doing it right. And I go through this every freaking day. Every time a company hires us, the, the sales leader or a group of them said, oh yeah, this is just a slight change and other stuff we're doing. We're doing most of this. We want a, a refresh. And then after the training or after one session, they're like, holy fuck, this is nothing like I thought it was, right? Everybody's so entrenched and they're taking the gap words and they're applying to the old world of selling and people just don't get it. They don't get it. So I can, I'll can, i help you out, Benjamin Davies, whatever Something you might think about is ENPS score, employee tenure, employee churn, and amount of roles filled. Those are their metrics. So when you say we help, what – what metric does that help? Yes. For, for corporate you? organizations, for recruiting firms is different. Right. You got to make sure we do relate. Really, I address recruiting firms. You address corporate recruiting. Yeah. But yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. And with that, we're going on to the next segment of this podcast, which is the challenge. This is the segment where Keenan and Beck break down a challenging subject within the industry. Uh, so the challenge for today is how to find and qualify prospects before making the call. Keenan, what are your thoughts on this one? Oh my gosh. Okay, how to find? I mean, look, I don't, I don't think finding prospects is very difficult today. I, I really don't. So the first is you got to ask yourself, what is my ICP? And we use that term a lot and, and maybe Beck will get into it. And maybe I'm making a mistake, not getting too far into it. I want to say a little high level on that. Just understand who you think will have the problems you're dealing with and who's probably having the greatest impact to them if those problems exist. So I'm making this shit up, but if I sell anything cybersecurity, I'm asking myself, okay, who could have cybersecurity issues? Well, probably almost anybody, but I'm going to say businesses over a hundred million or maybe over 50 to hundred million over that bare minimum. And then I'm going to say, but within that, who does it impact more? I mean, like I'm going to start with hospitals. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start with credit card companies. I'm going to start in the financial industry. I'm going to start with law firms. I'm going to start with people who have the greatest in most, most desired information and that if that information is actually gotten a hold of or put on hold or anything like that, that it could have massive damage. So that's where I'm going to start. So then from there, how do I find them? I'm going to LinkedIn. I'm going to find these people. And then from there, it's simply how can I craft my messages that lets them understand that I know their world. Mm-hmm. I, it's, it's, I mean, it's, I, look, Beck and I disagree to this a little just because things are changing and who knows where we'll end up but I'm less and less on board with one to many. I would rather spend six hours in a day only writing 30 emails that are very specific to the biggest customers with the greatest chance of a problem. So if I just win one of those, it's going to have a big impact in my quota than trying to get out to a bazillion different people that may or may not have it, that may be a small deal. I'm going to do that. So if I go after 25 hospital CTOs, today and it's very specifically written to their world and i go after 25 tomorrow and 25 tomorrow and 25 tomorrow that's i'm shitty at math but that's like 225 i believe right or 250 then i recycle back to them and do it again and make it customized i only need a couple of those in a month to build my pipeline and to get somewhere right so again it depends on what you sell etc yeah there you go sorry back what why do you think we disagree on that i don't know i maybe maybe we don't i'm sorry i i have I'm known for catching it at a teeth for saying you should personalize. <laughs> but I think how small my number is, that freaks people out when I say I will only target 10, 15 people in a day, maybe 20 max. 
if if you send more than 50 emails in a day, you will trigger email deliverability issues. Just as a quick reminder to everyone who wants to scale. Yeah. So what do you think about qualify? The second question was qualify, and then I'll go in. Oh, well, I don't qualify until I get them on the phone. And I'm very explicit with that. I don't deviate from that. I wrote it in my book. It's the simplest thing in the world. So I'll say it. I don't qualify anybody to pro wait, go. Am I not answering the question back? Do you mean like, let's say that I'm an S at SDR. How do they qualify? I didn't write this question, by the way, but I'm just thinking from the SDR perspective, they're probably thinking, how do I qualify on outbound? Same thing. One problem. Do, do, does the problem exist? Does the customer admit they have the problem? Can you fix the problem? Will they go on a journey to fix the problem? And that can be done by an SDR. That can be done over a call. That can be done in an email. I'm not asking for the world. Yep. Our sales are down. Yep, our um, conversion rates are lowering. That yep, we're, that we're at risk for cyber attack. Yep, whatever. I get one of those. Mm -hmm. We'll figure the rest out. That's it. It's great. Um, I think there's two there's two pieces that, or I'll break it up into two buckets of how. Sorry, there's a noise outside. <laughs> Just <laughs> someone at the Lemless building, he made a joke about someone break, it was, breaking like, it in. Uh, yeah, I was like, just can't even know him. Um, so the first half of it, how do you find prospects? I agree with Keenan. I would think about three different things. What is the level of title that would have the most problems? That we I like saw? that, yep. What is the discipline of title? And what is what are the traits of a company that would have that would cause and create an environment with the most problems? So how you can do that, and people will say, like, well, how can I find those people? I would go back to step one is I would go back to your inbound line and I would look for out of closed one, who did the first meeting start with? What was the level of their title? What was the discipline of their title? And what were the traits of their company? And see if you can find any analysis. Now, I will forewarn people, and this is going to be a big one that I think zero companies understand. Your inbound line is just your market's communication to you of based on what they know, based on what your marketing has said, that they believe you can solve. <clears throat> so number of different errors that could happen in there. It could just be you're marketing incorrectly and you're not marketing based on problems, or it also could be that they by and large don't realize that they have the problem that you solve for. So I will say that's a great starting point of like foreclosed one for inbound and for outbound separately what is like, what are the trends that I'm seeing? But to Keenan's point from a data perspective, after someone does get in, in the funnel, like after someone does close, I would try to understand which buyer is having which problem and what environment caused that. So you can mirror that onto your ideal customer company. So I've never seen a com uh, I take that back. I've seen one company evaluate their IC, I'll call it ICC, ideal customer company, on that they uh, were selecting traits that meant that they had a bigger problem. So they selected essentially from a marketing perspective, how many hacks has this person usually had on their website and that increased their MQL score. And I was really impressed. Uh, the only piece I'll add on the qualifying <laughs> bit is to double down on what Keenan said, qualifying is not you asking them if they have money or if they are the right level of title or if they have a quote unquote need or what their timeline is. None of those questions are a question that you should be asking outright in discovery. Actually, I'd argue that none of those questions are the ones that you should even be thinking about. You should be developing their needs that they don't even know about by finding problems that they don't know. So being qualified I think one of the biggest myths, and this probably should have been in, the, in, in sales mythology, the biggest myths is that conversion ratio is on average 20% into closed one. What I see is inbound conversion is 35%, outbound conversion is 6%, and people are hybriding it and saying 20. There's one problem. The second problem is your conversion ratio is dependent upon what becomes an opportunity 
into what's closed one. And the problem behind that is what becomes an opportunity is whatever the an AE decides is an opportunity, right? And they have incentive to disqualify pipeline because it, they always want more and they always want better. So they actually have an incentive, like if something's not gonna close and I believe that it's because of my sales ability, you'll see AE say like, it went dark. But what they like, I'm never gonna say it's because I didn't close them correctly and I measured on conversion. So the conversion metric is from an SQO point that does not make any freaking sense, is always subjective in nature and has an inherent agenda to say that it wasn't qualified. So us measuring that as a data point with non-objective criteria of like, was there a need? Was there a timeline? Was there any kind of buyer intent? Is so bananas, I like lose my mind over it. I think that's one of the biggest problem when looking at any kind of metric within the sales sales industry sales velocity conversion like it's dependent upon it becoming an opportunity so my suggestion would be that you have hard thermographic or demographic criteria if you're going to include in me i don't believe that you should and you should measure what like did they hit these certain traits and if so qualified if they send a second email qualified and measure from there into closed one if you're going to measure that conversion so qualification breaks down to if they have a big enough problem they will find the cash they will find money go ahead man so no bant <laughs> no bant <laughs> 20%. I'll ask people, I'll say, what's the conversion ratio for your AEs? What's the swing between them? I've seen in the, from the same pool of leads a 95% conversion with one AE and a 5% conversion with another AE. Same pool of leads. So I'm like, so you're telling me that there's that drastic of a swing rate of how qualified they are? I'm like, no, it's just their opinion. <laughs> I was like, you'll see them convert them right before closed one they're like oh it's qualified it's an opportunity it counts and here keep going keep going hold up we are going to the last segment of our podcast this is a new one uh keenan would you like to explain what this uh segment is about or you want me to take care of it take care of it producer man all right. Well, I know this, you're too young to know where it came from. Some some people will get this. Yeah, I have. Okay, so there is a reference to the '70s movie called Columbo. TV show. TV show. Sorry about a detective. Um, and we're taking a little uh a little phrase from there as the last segment of our podcast moving forward, and this segment is called "Just One More Thing." So this segment is where Keenan and Beck will tell us their closing thoughts, any rants that they have. But Beck, would you like to start us off? Wait, I it's renamed and I have to start off? Yeah. <laughs> cool. And you, already, and you already gave up your kick it to Keenan. Welcome to Paris. <laughs> no, one not. more thing. Oh, I actually stepped in Merid today. My first Parisian Merid. And if you don't know what Merid is, just look it up afterwards and... <laughs> I'll give you a hint. I stepped in it. <laughs> Welcome to Paris. Um, my wait, wait, just, just one more thing. Just one more thing. Uh, See, I pull cool part back. It doesn't. The reason I did this is it doesn't have to be a rant. I found that we were really struggling to be mad at something. A rant. So it's just one more thing. Well, I did sometimes too. Yeah. It's just one more thing. This is our chance to add something to the podcast that we think will add value that's just wide open for us. Like, wait, just one more thing and you get to yeah. it. One more thing. So just one more thing. Uh, there are lateral problems that are created, meaning I buy a product and it solves the problem on paper, but it creates a whole nother lateral problem. And I want to encourage sellers today that you need to have your buyers back about those lateral problems and give them a heads up beforehand ethically. I'm going to give one example and I'm going to pass to Keenan. 
I bought a phone for the New York marathon because I, my current phone was losing charge and I was afraid that I basically would lose music in the middle. I wouldn't be able to finish in the time that I thought. And I would like the impact was I would have spent my life, the rest of my life thinking I was a fake that I couldn't do something like that. <laughs> so I bought the phone and it solved my problem. Music was fine, but it created a whole new one. Your backgrounds shift very easily on the new iPhone 14. So what that meant to me was near the end of the marathon, I must have hit it so many times that it locked my phone, me out of my phone for an hour. So when I crossed that finish line, I didn't eat the entire race. So I went over to the side. I thought, I'm like, I do not feel okay. I sat down in the grass and I basically passed out. My body temperature spiked down to 89. Some random guy found me and he basically put me over his shoulder, took me to a medical tent. I spent three hours in the medical tent. They had to put salt blocks underneath my tongue. They had to rehydrate me. I don't even remember any of it. It was three hours long. And the entire time, all I was thinking was, I cannot call my dad and tell him where I am because my phone has locked me out. So I'm like, I'm either going to, this hour is going to run up <laughs> and I'm going to be able to call him. Uh, I did think in my head, I was like, Keenan shared on my location. My dad's shared on my location. So they might be able to put it together on like where I am, call each other and put it together. Or I'm just going to finish this marathon and die in the grass. That's what I genuinely was going through my head. Because how about I thought, like I entered hypothermia stages. My body temp was 89, right? So that lateral problem, I do not believe. That, that was before you were born. Like, I don't believe that an Apple associate did not know that that lateral problem would have been created specifically for runners. So my bag and plea is I know it's uncomfortable when sometimes a lateral problem can be created by your product. Like you sell sales engagement all of a sudden, like you need email templates, for instance, that are actually going to work. But I suggest ethically and having your buyers back that you should get ahead of those lateral problems for them so that you're always on their side. I believe that they can feel it and they'll thank you afterwards. You know, what's your rant? Oh, sorry. What's your just thing? So this gentleman, Gary Glucroft, that's why you connect combine spin with gap and challenger. So here's my challenge to you, Gary. Same question I asked of, um, of Scott, where does spin and challenger fill holes that gap has? Cause I don't believe it does. So I want to hear your perspective. What is gap missing that you need to add spin and challenge to improve upon? Okay. So here's my, uh, here's my last thing or my one more thing. Um, and this is, this is, this is anecdotal or it's my opinion. So everybody can take from what they will, but this, and I will never write a book about this. I, I will talk about it, but I'll never write a book. I'll never, I, I say, I'll, I'll never write a blog post. I might write a blog post, but let me rephrase it. I will only identify the problem. They will never, you will never see from me a book, blog post, audio, or anything on how to do it because there is no how. This is simply a choice. What I have come to realize in the last three or four years that one of the greatest assets to a salesperson, I could argue to any type of success. I really could argue to any type of success, but more, particularly, I believe this, what I'm about to say is particularly more profound in sales because salespeople have greater flexibility in how they do their job than a lot of other professions. You have a lot of leeway as a salesperson. And this is what it is. This is one of the most important, valuable traits, skill sets, actions, whatever you want to call it. Fucking drive. Mm -hmm. A maniacal drive to get it fucking done. And for whatever reason, that is missing across way too many salespeople. I do not see the sense of urgency, drive, maniacal, like, go, 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 get it done, get it, solve it, solve it. Oh my God, I'm behind quota. I got to fix it. Like, I don't see that. I do not see it. I see far too many people roll into the quarter. Oh, I missed it. Maybe next quarter. That shit would give me anxiety when I sold. 
I just, I will get on with salespeople who are missing their quota or struggling. I'm like, did you think of this? No. Did you think of that? No. Well, what have you done? I I don't know. They just keep doing what they've always done. They create no creative approaches. They don't try to do something different. They don't reach out for help. They don't put in more hours. They don't change what they're doing. They don't assess what the problem is. They, they, they get stuck in analysis paralysis. Well, I'm just trying to assess what's going. Where is the sense of urgency and where is the drive? I just don't see it anymore. And I don't care how much you follow gap selling. I don't care whether you spin. I don't care how many hours you work, et cetera. If you don't have the, a maniacal drive, a sense of fire to win at all costs, you will never be in the 1%. Well, that's not true. The whole bar is coming down. The whole bar is coming down. So actually, you probably could be in the 1%. The whole bar is coming down. I just don't see the drive anymore. And I don't understand why. And it's sad. Well, that's the end of our podcast. I don't either. It makes my stomach hurt. And yep. I'm like, bro, I don't need your excuses. I don't need your stories on why. Yep. They're not going to help me. They're not going to help you. Mm-hmm. Just, yeah, I, I remember when I wanted to start in sales development content one night on a Saturday night, I sat there and I searched on LinkedIn SDRs and for four hours just connected with them on a Saturday night. And I'm like, you probably have a thousand examples of that. And, you know, I have certainly not always been that person in my life and I'm not consistently always that person, but it's like, if you don't have that, you have nothing. Nope. Nope. It's, it's literally like, I, I, I know this is the longest night that we've ever done some good topics, but I was literally talking to a salesperson not too long ago and they had this deadline coming up and I was like, so what's the response? Well, I haven't got the emails out yet. Like you got a week and a half. What do you mean you don't have the emails? Well, I was really trying to perfect this and do this. And I wanted to make sure this was right. And I was focused on this. I'm like, basically you've done nothing. (laughs) Just start. I was like, I was like fucking do like, I said, how long do you think it's going to take to get these people to respond? Well, maybe a week or so. And I'm like, and then what are the chances you can get enough people to participate? Well, and it's, Oh God. Literally it was like, well, I never thought of that. Yeah. Should have, Brendan. If yes. You're actually planning on executing. That's ex- that was exactly. I was like, that's. Just, what do you mean you didn't think of it? Up more and start doing stuff. Fuck yeah, yeah. Join yeah, insane. Start doing stuff. Yep. Yep. Just fucking do it. Even if it's not right, at least then I sort of believe you give a crap. And like, they, you've learned something. Start. Yep. Doing stuff. Yep. If you care, or if not. Just be like, I don't care. Like, quit or whatever. Yep. Yep. You got it. <laughs> I never thought of that. Maybe I should take a step back. <laughs> oh, oh, God. Yes. Yep. <laughs> this All is- right. So with that, everybody, y'all have been listening to the longest version of Sales Top to Bottom. It's the longest. I'm your host, Keenan. Je suis votre cohort, Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> Be sure to put subtitles in that, please. <laughs> For sure. Au revoir. Au revoir. Until next, y'all. You know what I'm going to say. Peace. I'm out. <laughs>